so he went to do a PhD in economics at uh, University of Chicago, where he had two Nobel Prize winners as uh, supervisors. And then he decided once that piece is conquered, uh, to give it all up. And then uh, he worked as a financial advisor for about three years to the uh, board of directors, to the chairman of the board of directors of UBS. And uh, now he's coming here to teach us a little bit about his investment company. Right. Perfect. Thank you very much for the invitation. Very happy to be here. I'm very happy about the flags here. <laughs> Great honor. And uh, let's start. So this is an investment fund. It's called Rappaport Flagship Limited. Uh, it's a BVI approved fund. BVI is the British Virgin Islands. This, this is where the legal entity is incorporated. Uh, there's a this quick disclaimer here that this is not to be construed as investment advice or a recommendation to buy a security. This is the performance since January 1st, 2015 till the end of February. I have just about extended to the end of March and then April. I'm getting better at doing this uh, more quickly to update. So this is the aggregated share, share price of uh, my series as a manager in the fund. The red line is the performance of Red Flag, and the black line is MSCI and World Equities. Uh, why that is a comparison? Because, just because there's nothing else uh, that comes to mind that you can compare this to. Of course, you can compare it to the sum of the components, but then you get something identical. So what's the point? A little bit about myself, I was born in Israel, lived five years in Chicago in my PhD. Uh, now I'm living three, almost four years in Zurich, Switzerland. I have an EU and Israeli pa uh, passports. I'm the investment manager of the fund. I have a PhD in finance and economics from the University of Chicago Wood School of Business and Department of, uh, of Economics. A quarter before my defense, both Gene Fama and Lars Hansen on my thesis committee got the Nobel Prize. I wake up one morning and this is what happened. Got my BA in economics and management at Tel Aviv University. I served for three years as financial advisor to Axel Weber, uh, chairman of the board at UBS. I learned a lot there from reviewing the material of the board of, of directors. Uh, I teach also a brand new course at the University of Zurich called Money and Banking. It's a course which contains zero theory and uh, contains everything you need to know about the basic mechanics of the transactions that seems to have been forgotten to be taught by uh, the academic profession. You know, the basic credit debit between the banks and the central bank, transfers, debt, equity, and so on and so forth. I really teach at a very basic level, but builds upon it. So let's jump straight in. Uh, we could skip that. The, the investment strategy specializes in crowdfunded and other assets. Now there's nothing revolutionary about crowdfunding, and especially there's nothing revolutionary about many of these asset classes. For example, personal loans, by far the biggest uh, asset class that's being crowdfunded or brokered online has been around since the times of Moses. And the second aspect of crowdfunding, which is slicing up financial assets into smaller pieces for further distribution, such that an investor such as yourself or such as the fund doesn't have to front the entire loan amount to a person but can pledge only a slice of it, say five euro out of a 2,500 euro loan. Slicing up financial assets is nothing new in finance either. So calling the crowdfunding or peer-to-peer -peer revolution a revolution uh, is often uh, an overstatement. The main asset classes the fund invests in are personal loans, real estate bridge loans. We'll get to what each of this is and what, what are the mechanics behind it. Uh, pretty quickly. Invoice financing, even though that's uh, kind of a marginal uh, element, uh, component of the fund, and margin loans, as, ca as in capital provision of margin loans. 
we'll get to that. That's actually the most complicated part, uh, but I'm sure you want to nothing is that complicated in finance. The fund invests in assets denominated in global currencies, uh, which I hedge back to the dollar uh, with futures and cryptocurrencies which I don't hedge because I want to keep the, the Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies uh, exposure. But I lend them out, of course, and make a rate of return on these as well. The fund owns also a small portfolio of global securities in a passive manner, so as to uh, be easily uh, meet, meet clients' redemptions. And the public securities portfolio also serves as collateral against uh, the, the, the FX hedges. So the issue is that the loans are booked in one broker, but the FX hedge, the short futures of say Euro dollar or pound dollar or New Zealand dollar back to the US dollar, uh, these are booked with uh, another broker which doesn't recognize the value of the loans with the other broker. So I need to keep some ETFs with this broker that serve as collateral against the FX hedges. Okay, so I load on, I load passively, passively on these well-established factors: global equities, short volatility, investment-grade credits, sub-investment-grade credits, and long-dated government bonds. Okay, a little bit about the investment philosophy. I call it a semi-passive investment philosophy. So the asset base is extremely diversified over many borrowers and issuers, over many asset classes, over many jurisdictions, and over numerous counterparties. Right? I call counterparty uh, the banks, brokers, exchanges, and online investment platforms by which the fund invests. You can call all these brokers a counterparty. Okay, some of the liquid assets are un under-recognized. Uh, underinvested are offering very high returns. They are very, uh, they, yet they are very diversified over many issues, and so provide a steady stream of what can only be judged as excessive returns. Of course, this is up for opinion. Maybe the return is high now; it'll be abys abysmal in the future. Nobody can say ex ante that an asset is a good asset. But nonetheless, we in the investment business, and we're placing capital to make it. The investment objective is to achieve a high return of 10 to 15 percent annually by investing into baskets of very diverse assets. The asset allocation and overall risk level is set such that under a combined and severe stress test, the realized return would be no, more, no worse than minus 15. And look at the subjective stress test. Uh, it assumes a severe global recession stocks going down 40 percent and uh, a default of one or two of the funds uh, counterparty and a 50 percent decline in the price of Bitcoin now this these two is what makes it a combined and this one is makes it severe and that's why I call it combined and severe stress test is that both uh, idiosyncratic and, and, and systematic elements to the stress test The fund engages in active negotiations with all third-party providers in order to proactively uh, maintain cost control and also with uh, the platforms. We we'll talk about this a bit later. I negotiate on behalf of the fund uh, with these brokers, online lending platforms, in order to get preferential investment terms, such that if a platform usually keeps 6% one-time brokerage fee on the flow of, invest of investment, I would get a 5% kickback, not to myself, but it would be credited in full to the investors, to the fund. And the bigger I get, the more deals I can get. And the platforms are very happy to go along with it because they understand I'm a first mover and they are also first movers in a certain extent. They still are looking to grow and they understand that if they uh, give me this treat, which I pass on to my investors, then more investors can come through me to them. The investment strategy follows a semi-passive approach. 
It's passive in the sense that no single stock picking, no single bonds picking, no frequent market timing is undertaken. I don't do that kind of stuff. It's active in the sense that, and also on the platforms, once I start working with a given platform, I don't pick and choose a single loan and say I'm overweight this loan relative. I just click auto invest. Uh, that, that, that's usually provided by these platforms. So in that sense, it's passive. In the following sense, it's active is that the allocation to these crowdfunded assets being brokered online is oversized relative to their prevalence in the investment universe. Okay, so they're maybe 85% of the, of the portfolios in crowdfunded assets, but uh, if you look at the overall investment universe, you should probably have it be 1 or 2%, no more. So that in by itself is an active decision. And which platforms to work with is also an active decision. So just keep that in mind. Great. So when you say you just keep, click the auto invest, you automatically have to go along with whatever the platform says uh, right. as an investment opportunity. Yeah. And some platforms might be, you know, more on consumer loans, micro consumer loans or stuff like that. You have absolutely no control when you just do auto. So this most, is most platforms specialize in one asset class. So most platforms are, are they're personal unsecured, then they do personal unsecured with different degrees of risk. Mm -hmm. If I click auto invest, that means that whatever spare cash I have, either from a first time deposit or from returning principal and interest, gets reinvested into new loans that come on their platform after the platform has vetted these new loans for crowdfunding. But then, uh, do you have certain uh, rules, like for for the risk level that you take upon, that you know, with uh, yeah, let's they, say with the yeah. parameters X, Y, and Z, yes. I invest if it surpasses some certain limits. Yes, they have they have you some parameters kind of you can adjust. play with, oh. but I just choose the most broad. Uh, diversification over their entire spectrum of loans coming to market because I feel there's no point in trying to come up with a clever algorithm to pick and choose the loans on a given platform uh, given that the platform has already pre-vetted these loans decided whether they should get the loan or not at what interest rate and at what amount relative to amount to the amount that the borrower uh, requested and uh, yes, this is a, a, a good question. Some uh, people in this sphere uh, advocate that they have created a, a smart algorithm that beats the house algorithm. So they, they say that they do better than the house algorithm that just dis distributes according to the house algorithm. Uh, and say that they program something to outdo that. But I think that's uh, a, bit, a bit of a waste of time because uh, several of the CEOs of these online platforms that I work with, they've explained to me that what they do is they follow what the algo traders do and see which loans they seem to be buying more so than others. And if these loans uh, seem to them, the platform, as, well, actually they are a good deal, they default less than what we anticipated, and guess what? They decrease the interest rate on those. So you're kind of playing against the house. It's not a free market that there's any point in trying to outdo it. This is my opinion. This is roughly the asset allocation, okay? Relative to equity. You know, uh, about 40% goes into personal loans. That's all over the world. The US, the UK, Central and Eastern Europe some in Australia and New Zealand, over several of these platforms. The fund is diversified literally over more than 10,000 individual borrowers over several platforms. And the expected return after losses, after fees, is about 13.5%. The second biggest asset is real estate bridge loans. After I go through the list, I'll go over in depth what is each. Real estate bridge loans uh, is a mortgage for real estate in development. It's not your mom and pop uh, mortgage that they live in the house and they pay 2% to the bank. 
they, this is, these are riskier uh, development projects, uh, and, and, and accordingly the, the interest rate is high. And this is very popular in the US and in the UK, but also in Australia and New Zealand you can get some assets, and in Central and Eastern Europe. Margin loan, this is uh, the, the most complicated asset to understand. It has to do with Bitcoin exchanges. I'll get to that in a, in a minute. This is totally uncorrelated, I'd say, with any severe recession that might happen. And there are some, some other uh, asset classes one can get access to, such as pawnbroking loans. Literally, uh, you can get exposure to uh, diamond ring that someone wants to uh, pawn to get some cash at an interest rate of 12 or 15 percent and the broker would keep some juice above that uh, but if you can if you can get uh, a wide enough portfolio of that then the returns are pretty good over a long period of time and there are a few papers out there about these seemingly excessive returns and persistently so over decades of, uh, of pawnbroking loans super interesting industry uh, some other assets the fund can get invested in, but chooses not to. Uh, SME loans and SME invoices. I don't like these assets too much. They seem to be uh, riskier than junk bonds, which you can buy uh, in, in the securities market, but seem to be offering the same kind of rates. Some of these uh, companies uh, that borrow money, they don't produce audited reports. One really needs to be careful with lending to SMEs online, is my opinion. Auto loans, really there are not many out there uh, that provide access to lending uh, against autos, and uh, the returns there are not that good either. Aircraft loans, actually there's one in the UK that you can lend to uh, companies or individuals. They need some financing for their airplane, either that they're working some uh, that small line that nobody else is working and they make money off that. Interest rate there is about 10% and max loan to value is about 60%. And again, this is all managed by a broker uh, that has legal expertise in writing the loan agreement and taking charge and making sure that there are no other charges against the same asset and in taking these people to court in case of default. So how do you, how do you decide it's 40% uh, and not 38? That's a very good question. What drives me is the stress test. Apologies that it doesn't look too good. My, my student needs a little bit to improve on the looks of this one. Uh, I look at the stress test and what I assume will be the loss during a severe and combined stress loss. Mm -hmm. And I adjust the, and I set the, the parameters of the asset allocation accordingly. Of course, this is a subjective stress test. No stress test uh, is, is objective. But I feel that trying to look at historical correlations and drawdowns, that would be just uh, simply futile because there is no uh, drawdown on, say, real estate bridge loans haven't defaulted since, since we have data in 2009. Right? So, so in a way, you just do sort of a conditional value at risk. Yeah, said, I it's want a to more than 15%, they might yeah. combine, I see where it comes from, right. and then you play along with that. So it's subjective, conditional. Uh, yes, C bar. Yes. <laughs> okay. We can skip this uh, agro loans and startup and private equity. I do have some public securities here. This is global stocks, a little bit short volatility. Anyone knows the ticker VXX, I'm chronically passively short VXX, eating the roll yield on the VIX futures curve. This means something to anyone. Uh, credits, both investment grade and junk grade, mostly in the US and, uh, and in Europe. I tried to get the ETFs that are listed uh, either in Ireland or Luxembourg or Switzerland, so as to avoid the U.S. Uh, withholding tax, legally of course. Uh, Gavi bonds. I do have an ETF of uh, global Gavi bonds, uh, both for liquidity and both 
Uh, it kind of helps in the stress test. And that's the idea. I say that in, uh, when you go to the supermarket, if you buy a little bit of sausage, a little bit of ham, a little bit of bread, a little bit of tuna, a little bit of everything, you mix it all together, that does not make for a nice meal. But in investment, actually doing that is the right recipe to success. Hopefully, nothing is guaranteed in finance. And a little bit of the loan liability, which I incur. I usually don't take the margin loan. I just uh, use uh, the leverage ETFs where I can, because it's cheaper for me. Uh, let's skip the stress test. And let's go to the asset classes, so we can get back. Okay, so this joke I already said, assets which uh, were previously available only to banks, small private lenders, and wealthy families are now available to the public. What makes it different is that assets which in the past would have been financed in whole by a lender who had almost exclusive access are now being financed online in smaller pieces by many crowd financiers. Nothing new under the sun. People always say fintech, so there's nothing revolutionary or technological about it, except the technology underlying the Bitcoin blockchain, which is right now there's a race to patent all the different embodiments and systems around it. It's, uh, it's, it's, quite, uh, it's quite impressive what's going on in that field. Let's talk about personal unsecured. It's uh, by, by far the biggest asset class being crowdfunded online with Lending Club being the biggest originator, mediating about a billion dollars worth of personal loans per month. Okay, that's already big. Underwriting process. You take the personal details, location, age, sex, marital education, employment, work experience, house ownership, etc. The loan detail, the purpose of the loan for loan. Most of the loans are for loan consolidation. Okay, so they're re refinancing more expensive credit card debt or payday loans, refinancing them online. Redecoration of the house, business expense, education, travel, transportation, health rather. Okay, the income verification. Uh, they ask the person to send in the payment slips, whatever they get from their pension, whatever they get is alimony, and it gets verified. Or not. Sometimes they lend even if it's not verified, but of course then the interest rate is higher. Expense verification, okay, they try to verify first and foremost the expense one uh, incurs on a regular basis due to servicing other existing loans, and if uh, the person needs to pay child support and alimony, these things could be verified independently. Asset verification, if the person owns a home, if he owns a car, Liability verification, that's the most important thing. If there's a mortgage loan outstanding, if there's a car loan outstanding, credit card debt, personal loan, payday loan, you'd be amazed at uh, how uh, some people have a lot of loans outstanding. People uh, are, uh, some people are in not a good situation like uh, you know some other people, let's say. Credit check, past payments problems with regards to utility bills, past loans, etc. You can read the side note afterwards, it tells you how the credit companies work. But everything that I told you, you must be imagining uh, some very elaborate regression with logic and logic and whatever, whatnot. Uh, that's all beautiful, but the main variable that will, has been currently and will always be the main determinant of uh, the credit decision, yes or no, and what interest rate is affordability. The monthly payment on the new loan, so if you're gonna take this new loan, you're gonna have to pay another, say, 100 euros per month to repay it, principal and interest, because it's a, the, use the, usually these personal unsecured are uh, fixed monthly payments. So first you pay mostly interest, and towards the end you pay mostly principal, divided by the current income less current expense. 
Okay? And you don't want this ratio to be over 70%. So all the regressions you have in your mind, they can add a few, a bit of a reduction in default rate, and that's probably great for writing an academic paper. But if you're starting out lending in any place in the world, if you know this, you can start doing it profitably. Debt servicing to uh, net income ratio. Think about it. If you're gonna take on a liability now that will make you pay a hundred dollars every month, uh, what's a hundred dollars to you? A lot, a little. Let's look at what you have incoming and, exp and going, uh, anyways. But then, um, I don't, uh, you said affordability. You said affordability to maximum affordability to seventy percent. But then, uh, do you? I don't, I, don't, I don't run this regression. I'm just explaining generally what's the engine behind these uh, online brokers. Because you know, 70% to someone who earns $200 and 70% to someone who earns $2,000. Sure. It's a bit <laughs> no, this is just a simplification to say yeah. that they have all these models, but when it comes down to, to the most simple, to what it comes really down to, is this one is by far the most important variable in credit decisioning. Credit decisioning is three, three things. Yes, no, to give them a loan, at what interest rate, and what amount relative to the amount you have requested. Okay, so the collection. Crowdfunding loans are considered personal and unsecured debt. Not all crowdfunded loans are unsecured, but personal unsecured loans uh, does not mean that the, simple, that the borrower simply cannot repay. The fact that the loan is not backed by any assets, not in the least bit means that the person can simply walk out of his debt. In fact, all my lending platforms will utilize the same. Uh, and another thing, in the event of non-repayment, the borrower the, uh, the law offers the exact same remedies to crowd lenders as it does to banks and private lenders. Okay, so even if I make a loan as a person to another person, we sign a loan agreement, right, and you default, then I can take you to court and I will not be treated worse than a bank uh, taking you to court if you had borrowed from a bank. The law doesn't discriminate in favor of the banks in these cases. So the, that makes sense if you do like a one million, but if the one who defaults borrows 500 euros, it probably costs you more just to call the lawyer. So how do they get around this size issue? So they work, uh, if it's, they have this decision, if it's small, they usually go with credit collection agencies. Then if you're a borrower, you can expect tester recalls, emails, text messages, and they know to call you in the evening when you get back from work. It's a profession that's been around for a long time. <laughs> right about now, uh, people start feeling uneasy because they associate themselves with the borrower instead of the lender. So people start uh, kind of not feeling well in their chairs. But let's move on. Uh, so pestering reminders, account freeze. In certain jurisdictions, uh, the law allows freezing the borrower's personal bank account without a court order. Okay, sometimes you need to go to court and get a judgment in order to freeze his personal assets, but sometimes you don't, depending on the jurisdiction, depending on the country. Just think about it, even if you're poor and you have no money in your bank, uh, if it's frozen now, that still is a problem for you. And collection agencies usually get a percentage compensation as a function of what they collected, principal and interest, and courts. And sometimes it's necessary to, to, get, to go to court, 
and push the person into personal bankruptcy. In that case, you can uh, sell his house, his car, whatever other assets. And of course, if there's a mortgage against the house, then that mortgage gets priority, gets paid first, and whatever is left uh, goes to pay back the uh, personal loan. That's a good question. If a credit card loan has priority over a personal loan uh, provided online, that's a very good question. I think it's pari passu. A little bit more on the collection because that's one of the main aspects in the beginning for a person to become convinced that this is a legitimate way to invest because a lot of people have been giving me this look, are we sure you're not silly giving your money away online? But no, you don't question if the bank is being silly when it gives a loan to a client. You don't question that the bank is being silly. And uh, the law does not discriminate against online lenders or even private lenders in, on these matters. The law is the law. So uh, there could be a renegotiation. The platform may offer debt relief uh, commensurate with what, with what they expect the court would decide in order to cut things short, to keep it cheap. Uh, debt relief, the court might evaluate the repayment ability of the borrower and may impose a reduction in the monthly payment, a rescheduling of the debt over a longer period of time, a reduction in interest, and or uh, principal forgiveness. So it takes about a year and a half from the time borrower defaults to when he starts paying back at least some of what he owes. Something called a garnish order. I encountered this in Africa. Uh, these rules have been around since forever when personal loans were happening. And uh, so a garnish order means that any future employer uh, must deduct a certain amount set by the court as a function of the loan uh, outstanding and in default and pay it directly to the lender. It's called the garnish order, that's by common law. API access to the courts, this cool thing. So some courts allow API access such that legal proceedings can begin without the need to write a letter or send an email. So 60 days of non-payment, bam, case court starts. Nobody even needs to click a button. It's all API access from the platform to the court system. In Finland, I know this is how it works, and I think also in Estonia, your neighbor. And let's talk about the expected returns, duration, size, number of loans, fees, and stress loss. Lending club lends at an average interest rate of 13%. The average default rate is 5%. The fee is 1%, which gives about 7% average net returns to investor. Uh, other platforms that the fund invests uh, are lending at a higher interest rate and realizing almost double the uh, return. A duration of personal unsecures varies between 30 days and 5 years. Okay, so it's not that common uh, for a person to borrow money for 5 years. If you think about it, that kind of makes sense. If you're borrowing 10,000 euros to fix up your house or because you were in a kind of a situation, then uh, it's going to take you five years to pay it back. This is some of the data that, some of the, the, that one platform produces. Every platform uh, produces some aggregate data about the loan being originated. The better the data, the more uh, confidence an investor gets in the platform, that they know what they're doing. This is one platform that I invest through. They have realized 17.3% net return. You can see the average loan size is 2,400 euros. Average duration is 48 months, that's four years. Average interest rate is 29%. They've had 1.1 billion euro of signed applications of which they approved only 170 million, of which only 60 million were actually taken up. Well, you can get a feel from this that they're constrained on the investor side. And the, the annualized net return on investment 
is 17.3%, which is fantastic in euros. So it goes down from 20, from, let's say from 30, it goes down to 17. So that's a big default rate, but also a very high interest rate, such that net, if you're getting what I believe is the highest return on a diversified asset that one can get, that the public can get. This is, is this a return off the taxes? Like no, no tax, no tax. There's no point in the entering. No, no, I mean fees. Fees, fees. Yeah, fees. fees. No, this includes fees. Oh. Now the platform gets fees reimbursed to them. Okay, my fund gets a special deal with them. So uh, say uh, a borrower comes to borrow 100 euros from this platform and the fund invests 100 euros through the platform and he gets it. The borrower would get 94 dollars euros straight off the bat and the platform would keep six as its one-time fee. And, uh, but the borrower would owe interest on 100 notion. And then uh, I have an agreement with the, the, the platform that they will pass 5% back to my fund. Of the six that they took one time, 5% I get as a kickback, not to me personally, but to the fund. Okay, this is part of the value added that I offer to my clients. Okay, some more data being produced. This is how a long book looks like. So even for a small investment of 36,000, of course the, the amount of investment has grown significantly since, you can get diversified over. There's no laser. Yeah, but it, I don't know if it works. No, never mind. So for 36,000 euros, you can, uh, I can get diversified over 3,000 loan slices. So that corresponds to roughly 3,000 borrowers. And that's good. You want to be diversified. So you said the platform has access to data about where these people work. Absolutely. Right? So they're, do, do you have any idea? Do they diversify over industry? Do they want to be exposed? You know, it might look like you're diversified because you're in five countries. But everybody works for the auto industry, and then shit happens, and everybody gets unemployed. And even though it looks like you're super diversified, you're actually exposed to the same common factor, which is for like, employment in the same industry or something like that. Do they disclose anything about that? Or? They disclose that. You can look into their data and see okay. what kind of industry. Most of these people are unemployed. There's this thing called poverty in the world. I'm very sorry <laughs> that it exists. But these are like ninja loans then in the US. These were very popular in 2006. No income, no job. Ninja. That's right. right? This is like the... No, a lot, no I'm, I'm exaggerating. Okay. A lot of these people have jobs and it's verified and they have incomes. Okay. And it's verified. If you click on each and every one, you can see that this one has 2,000 euros per month income. This okay. one has 2,500 because they sent in the payment slip, they sent in the alimony slip, the pension slip, whatever they gave them has been verified. And yes, this is one of the risks. And we go over to, uh, on this, count, uh, this counterparty risk management philosophy. There is the risk that any one of the platforms ends up a fraud, mm -hmm. or God forbid, uh, you know, had systematically flawed underwriting practices as you suggest. There are many, many risks, and you've just mentioned one. One, you can read the fund's perspectives. I did a good job at explaining all the different risks to cover my, but in case of things going badly. But uh, I, I feel like I've raised all the red flags in, uh, in, in highlighting the risks involved in such, a, in such an investment. All investment contains risk, but I feel that this is a, the right way, and of course, I have my own capital, significant, uh, significant portion of it uh, invested in the fund, so I'm perfectly aligned. I do believe this is the right way to invest. Let me show you one thing that's going to blow your mind. This is aggregate U.S. credit card debt. 
from 1994 till 2016. The, the red line is the gross interest rate and the green line is the net of charge of return. And, and what you can see is that even in 2009 and Q1 2010, where they had the worst uh, write-offs, the return was still plus 4%. It never even went to negative territory. So that's not bad. And consider that right now in the US, it's about 14% average interest rate going down to, what is it? 9% net return. But I'm lending a 30% interest rate going down to 15% net return. That uh, could be riskier, and then in a recession maybe I lose more than this. But also you can say, well, you have a lot more cushion in case of a recession, you would still be positive. So in the stress test, going back, I assume that the largest allocation, which is personal unsecured, would still give a positive plus 4% return. Of course, this is subjective, but could realize is worse than that. A little bit about the platform features. So we discussed the auto invest. We can discuss the secondary market. So some platforms allow and uh, actually a, a, a vivid a secondary market has developed on some of these platforms. So uh, you can sell your loan slices, especially if they're still current and being paid on time, you can usually sell them for par or sometimes even for more than par. Uh, but of course, if they're default, you will have to put them down at a discount relative to par to try to sell them, and it may take time. But the best platforms have coded a pricing algorithm in the secondary market, such that new capital being deployed will go uh, to fill new loans on the, on, the, on the initial market, but also to buy up loan slices per sale in the secondary market. And that's a great thing because it gives a bid in the secondary market. If you're thinking if you want to invest, you're thinking, wow, I'm gonna get stuck for three or four years, the average duration, and, but if the secondary market has a strong bid, because auto, the auto-invest function just pours in money into that because it has a clever algorithm to price them, then it's, it's, it's a really good thing. So you can, you can get rid of your almost entire book in a matter of a few days at, at, uh, at, three, at no more than 3-4% discount. This is how the auto invest looks like. They have some you know, bells and whistles, but you're basically trusting them to do the allocation for you. It's not just the allocation. That's not the main thing. The main thing you're trusting them is to do the credit decisioning for you. And then the allocation is really just, you know, they're going along with them. Okay, this is the discussion about the APA access. We, we've covered this. You asked me why. Uh, shouldn't I program something on their system and try to uh, buy only a subset of loans? But uh, I don't do that because the CEO of one of these explained to me uh, straight out that uh, they have clever uh, mathematicians and uh, quantitative scientists and they follow the, the algo traders and if the algo traders seem to be buying one asset over the other and that asset seems to be actually doing better than the other assets or for the interest rate uh, price, then they would say, well, either it's luck, either uh, it's something, and then they would lower the interest rate. So you're really playing against the house and there's no point in investing so many human hours programming a, an algorithm to pick, pick and choose where in fact, you know, the entire loan book is giving you 15%. Let's talk about the next asset class, 
real estate bridge loans. Any questions so far? Actually, I have a question uh, uh, to hear. Yeah, okay. Uh, does the credit ratio, uh, does it do, well, have an impact on your, on your decision to invest or not? I mean, the credit ratio that uh, the crowdfunding platform gives. Uh, you mean the interest rate and the credit rating of yeah, the individual? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, because I, I trust the house algorithm. See, so I just choose the, the, the balance kind of house, the balance option of the house algorithm, and I get diversified into their entire spectrum of loans. So that's, I get their double A internal credit rating, the A internal credit, the B, Cs, and also the HR standing for high risk. So I get loans. All, all over the spectrum. You see, I get some C, E, D. This is internal credit rating, and you see the interest rate commensurate with So for the B, it's 13 and a half, for the HR, it's 42. I just get spread out over, over everything. There's just no point in trying to outsmart it. Real estate bridge loans. Uh, there has been an active market for short-term real estate uh, financing in every major economy for a very long time in, throughout history. How do you think all these buildings were built centuries ago? Somebody financed them, either with equity, but also with debt. The fund invests only in debt in real estate. I don't buy uh, equity stakes in real estate because that's just too long of a duration. Uh, I feel I need to trust too much uh, an external manager and uh, the valuation of it uh, would just be too sticky. I wouldn't know where, where to revaluate upwards, but uh, I do invest in, uh, these are short-term bridge loans, usually with 12 months duration. The short-term real estate market is characterized by a race between entrepreneurs to come up with the capital to buy uh, the property that's on the market. So if a property, let's say that building or some uh, central building in the main in, in central Vilnius would come to the market for some reason, there would be a race. There are many entrepreneurs out there that know how to tear a place up, build something new, get the permit, and they can envision the profit from it pretty easily. So there's a race between them to get the capital to buy it. Now, uh, the situation, the market is such, and always has been, that uh, on the margin, some of the people do it with debt, not fully with equity, because not everyone has equity to do it. And the, the hungriest people, then they require debt to get the bigger, to get the bigger deals. And uh, the thing is that uh, the banks don't lend them as quickly as they need it. By the time you even talk with someone in the bank, and by the time they do all their betting, it's long, long gone, the opportunity is off the market. So traditionally, they've gone to the families. The rich families have generations and generations of experience in lending short-term real estate bridge lending. And throughout the generations, these families have accumulated massive, massive wealth because they know if you know how to do it, uh, paying attention that the valuation is not inflated, that you're not lending too much against what you could collect from the sale in case of default. That's the main uh, thing to watch out for. Uh, then it's max 60 of 70% loan to value. Then default rate is basically zero. It stays forever. Of course, if credit quality begins to deteriorate, or if I get the feel that one of these platforms is getting is, is providing inflated valuations and lending effectively more than 70% loan to value, then I would pull out. And one thing that I'm looking with these brokers for real estate is a very strong legal team. I'm looking for a platform that knows its legalese like no other. They, they do not get any word wrong. 
uh, in what they draft and what they send to the borrower. And they, uh, yes, I'm looking for bullies uh, that can bully bullies. Because the borrowers, they are shrewd as well. Now we're talking about the real estate developers. You need to be careful from double dipping. Double dipping is a person, uh, you know, at the same time taking two loans, saying both loans are uh, same seniority. He gets more money. You have to uh, really do the due diligence. And they do. So some of these platforms, so this platform, for example, uh, has already brokered 300 million pounds worth of loans online. These are, this is one of the assets that they, uh, you see the, value, the security value is six, six million pounds. And the loan value is three point something million, 51% loan to value, 12% interest rate in pounds. You see who the valuation company, uh, who, is, who is the legal team that, uh, that took the, it's a first charge. That's very important to pay attention what you're getting, a first charge versus a second charge could be a huge difference. First charge means that in case of liquidation, this debt gets repaid first. So you really want it to be a first charge. Then even, even on this platform, the, I can get diversified over about 100 of these loan deals. So even for a small amount, that's when I started, and since then I've grown, you can get the exposure to hundreds of loans. Of course, not thousands or even 10,000 as in personal loans. There are just not so many of these deals relative to a person wanting to borrow 1,000 or 2,000 or 3,000 euro. Uh, so the diversification is lower in real estate bridge lending, but they hardly ever default because they are fully securitized, over, -secu over collateralized. So in the stress test, I assume, again, that there will be about 4% return. So if average interest rate is 12%, so you only get about 12%, uh, then I assume that in a stress test, in a recession, then uh, these things, will take longer to collect the money, right? Because they'll be in default, they'll be looking for a buyer. Will, some of these are exotic, looks kind of some sort of a castle, so it's kind of exotic. It's not, a, it's not an apartment in the center of Vilnius. You know it would be easier to liquidate. Uh, so some of these are exotic, so it'll take maybe a year or two, uh, but that's the kind of risk that I'm willing to tolerate for 12%. And so far, none of them has default. I mean, two or three have defaulted, all of them are in the state of default or extension almost all That's the nature of this lending because these people are looking to either refinance after with a bank or looking to sell. So there's always kind of an extension or they're rebuilding or adding parts. Uh, but when it reaches a point around 180 days of overdue, then the platform really uh, says that's it and they put the receiver on the, on the property and then if the entrepreneur wants to do anything, he has to say pretty please to the receiver. And this goes to an auction. And uh, this, this can end within three, four, five months. Uh, in a bad economic uh, situation, yes, it'll take about a year or two to get rid of these uh, properties. But even then, I don't expect there to be a principal loss, just loss of interest. So you can get exposure to hundreds of them. Similarly in the US. Now let me skip invoice financing because it's not as interesting and jump to the really interesting asset which is really new. So what's, what's, uh, what are margin loans? Most of you know margin loans as a loan that you yourself could take if you have a brokerage account and you fund it with $100 and you can buy $100 worth of Apple. 
say that's not enough for you. You want to buy another hundred dollars worth of Apple from money you borrowed from your broker. Uh, and you can do that. Where does the broker get the money from? From a bank. Where does the bank get the money from? From the depositors. Okay? These are very safe loans to the broker who lends them to you. Why? Because when you go into overdraft uh, and take on this margin loan and buy additional securities with money that you've just borrowed, you also sign, well, when you open the account, you sign that they can liquidate uh, your position in case your own equity deteriorates below a certain level. So let's say you bought $200 worth of Apple and now you have $100 loan liability and 100 own equity. If the value of Apple shares goes down to 115, you can still sell it for 115 and pay back the $100 loan. But if it goes to 99, you sell it for 99, but you owe 100, then the broker would take a loss. So around, the, when, around 115 is when the broker would liquidate your position to make sure that it wouldn't take any losses. And I know the big banks have huge portfolios of margin loans that they provide to clients, and in a regular year, they have 0, 0.00 losses. And in the worst year, 2009, they also have less than a quarter percent loss rate on a huge book of margin loans. It's simply it's the mechanics of uh, the margin call and liquidation that guarantee the principal and interest. So what does that get to do? I'm not a broker to be able to lend to, pe to people to buy Apple shares, but there are two Bitcoin exchanges, actually more than two, but two main ones. They allow uh, traders to purchase Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies using borrowed money by the utilization of a margin loan. Similarly, if the price of Bitcoin or other cryptocurrency purchased on loan deteriorates below uh, an own equity threshold, then the the, the margin call would kick in and the, the, it would be liquidated. So no losses have occurred on the platform so far. No credit losses have occurred so far. And this is completely consistent with the nature of margin loans. And actually the, the, uh, the threshold at which a margin call would be initiated is calculated on the depth of the book, the best bid and the depth of the book, not even the mid price. So it's actually the realizable price of the, of the assets purchased. But differently uh, from, uh, from brokers, uh, you should ask me, well, where do the exchange get the money to lend to the users who want to buy Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies on loan and lend it this way? They have done something revolutionary again, and they open the funding market to other users. So say you love Bitcoin, I know you do, I'm going to open your face, and you <laughs> deposit $100 worth, and you deposit $100 onto the bank account of the Bitcoin exchange. And then you go and buy $100 worth of Bitcoin from this guy, who liked Bitcoin in the past, but not anymore. And let's say that's not enough for you. Now you have $100 worth of Bitcoin, that's not enough for you. You want to borrow $100 more from me, at a market determined rate, there's a book for, for, for funds being loaned at an interest rate. This is how the book looks like. So there's $3 million uh, on offer to be borrowed at 0.09% per day. How much is 0.09% per day annualized 365 days in a year? Nobody can do it in his head, but I can tell you that five bips per day is exactly 20% annualized. With a zero credit loss to date, that's not bad. My fund's been writing this for a couple of years now. Okay, average duration is two to 30 days. And if you put it in uh, for 30 days, then you get priority over someone that puts it uh, as in, in a, for, for a lower duration and kind of a lexicographic uh, matching. And several interesting things about this. 
First is the very high interest, then uh, the question arises, first question that arises is, who's willing to pay such, a, such an interest rate? Annualized over 20%, sometimes it spikes to about 100% annualized. Uh, I tell you, that's not the question to ask, because these are speculators. They're betting on Bitcoin going up 5-10% in the next week or two, or in other cryptocurrencies, and there's 700 of them. Um, so that's so that's not the question because if you pay annualized 20 30 percent but you're expecting this to go up over a week or two if you're short-term speculator then it's clear where the demand comes from but where is the supply why doesn't supply rush in to supply capital at lower and lower interest rates now there are many reasons for that a not, not many people know about it b uh, the big institutions, even if they know about it, it's not in their mandate to, to, to place capital in this kind of investment with this kind of counterparty uh, just because they cannot. And third, there's a group of people who do have the capital, do know how to do this, are allowed to do this by their charter, but still feel that the counterparty risk is unpalatable. What happens if the exchange uh, defaults because it ends up a fraud. What happens if $72 million worth of Bitcoin gets stolen from the exchange? And that, uh, happened, uh, that actually happened. But then the exchange did uh, something really uh, noteworthy and they backed up all the losses. $72 million worth of Bitcoin were stolen, stolen and this exchange, Bitfinex, uh, all the kudos to them, they paid it back to the, to the penny. Fund does have a simple algorithm that uh, we, we coded. It's that uh, the rate at which loans are renewed, say dollar loans to finance Bitcoin, uh, needs, to be, needs to always be such that not, it's not too high or too low. So for example, if I renew my, if, if now one of the loans were returned, and I, I want always the money to be lent out, right? Because I want to collect my pennies to, to, to make an interest rate. I want the money to be working all the time. And I'm not, if, if, and I'm not, I don't want to renew that loan at five basis points because that was what the rate was when I put that, that loan that was just returned. That's just too low. So I'm missing out on all this, on all this gravy. Uh, but on the other hand, I don't want to place it too high either because then I would just stay back and back in the line and wouldn't get filled. So the money would be lying idle, I wouldn't make any interest. So uh, there is, I coded a little, a little algorithm that kind of reads this book and then places it just below uh, the, where, the bulk of the, where the bulk of the office uh, lays. So as to guarantee that the money is lent out always at a rate that's very close to the market rate. Any questions? So this, uh, I feel, is an excellent asset class because it's uncorrelated with anything. And commensurately in the stress test, I assume that it will continue providing 12.5% as in the base case. So the speculation can be both ways, right? It's either that they buy Bitcoins or they short Bitcoin. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So the fund owns Bitcoins as well and generates income on that using the exact same mechanism.